Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is KDR Studios. Uh, my name is Omweri Kebuato uh, from Minneapolis. And uh, this evening, we are privileged to have uh, Professor Nyang Nyongo, who is the Kisumu County Governor. And uh, he has paid us a courtesy call. So we are pretty happy that he's here. And we've got a few questions, if not more questions, for him to answer us. And you know, we are so many Kenyans living in the diaspora. And the KDR TV st uh, studios is watched all over Kenya, all over, let me say, all over the world. So, Professor Nyang Nyongo, yeah. welcome to America. Thank you very much. And welcome to the KDR TV studios. Thank you, thank you. So, Professor Nyongo, mm. what brings you to America? And well, specifically, Minneapolis? Well, I came to Minneapolis for two reasons. One is uh, we came as guests of the International Leadership Institute, uh, which is led by Judge uh, Lajun Lange. Um, we have been uh, in, in contact with Judge Lajun Lange for a long time, ever since I was Minister for Medical Services, over issues of disaster management, ambulatory services, and emergency. Um, our idea in Kisumu County, subject to the discussions we've had with, with the judge for a long time, is to see how the history and experience of the city of Minneapolis um, in uh, disaster management and in ambulatory services and, and, and fire services. Uh, how we can benefit from this in putting up a similar system in Kisumu. Um, Judge Lange has had a long, and, 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 the, and the fire department in Minneapolis has had a long relationship with the city of Eldred. And, uh, we think uh, that uh, this is something that could benefit from, so we came to discuss this. They also do a lot of training for firemen and for the fire department and for people engaged in emergency preparedness. So that's what we are here for primarily. Mm -hmm. But secondary, of course, we are here to meet you people. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, uh, uh, and, and, and to discuss and share what's going on in our, our country. That is beautiful. Uh, yesterday, um, you moved the crowd by giving them a speech. We don't really know that you had prepared, and uh, some people might be saying that uh, maybe you had uh, told the ODM people basically just to meet you, or let me call them NASA people basically just to come and meet you. Did you arrange for this, uh, or it was just an impromptu uh, town hall meeting? Well, I mean, um, friends had sent a message home, like yourselves, <laughs> that uh, when I'm here I should take time to, and, and discuss. And this is also important for us in NASA because these are NASA members. And we need to know what, 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 what you people think, your input, your appreciation or lack of it, or what's going on at home. And so that we can join hands in, in ensuring that we safeguard our democratic gains and ensure that Raila Molo Dinga becomes president to advance those gains. So uh, to me, it was very important that we should get together and uh, we share these ideas and I present to you what I think is the problem at the moment with the Jubilee government and why Jubilee want to roll us back to the dark days that we thought we had escaped from and why we must really be resolute in, 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 in advancing uh, democracy in our country. And I think to me this was a very important encounter last night and I'm glad that we spent the time we did to, 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 to have that discussion. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, once again, um, congratulations. You've been elected as the, uh, um, um, as the governor for Kisumu County. Yeah. In the next five years, what will, the rest, what will be the residents of, of, of Kisumu actually rem remembering you for? What do you have in plate for them? Well, you know, I've always said that Kisumu County, like I observed when I was Minister for Planning and National Development with regard to Kenya as a whole, Kisumu County is a county of great potential, but a disappointing underachiever. And that potential is what I want to awaken. And we don't want to be content with doing small things. As I've told the people of Kisumu, I don't want Kisumu to continue walking with a chicken. I like Kisumu to fly with the eagles. That means that we are going to initiate a process of great transformation in Kisumu. In terms of delivering better services to the people so that their lives can be changed for the better. I'm particularly concerned with those aspects of delivery that I call where the rubber touches the ground as far as people are concerned. Things like water, health, 
food, environment, cultural issues, communication, access to market. You know, these are issues that every resident of every village in Kisumu County feel on a daily basis. If kids go to school but they don't have food, going to school does not make sense to those children. If they go to school and they don't have clean water to drink, going to school will not make much because they will have been sick by the time they get to school. So education, while primary in people's lives because it gives you skills and makes you aware of what you should be doing in life and open to more opportunity to you really cannot be useful to you unless and until you have support from those things where the rubber touches the ground. You have good health, you have access to food, you live in a clean environment of course which is secure. Okay. And when you go to school you have a road to travel on and it is uh, <laughs> Is a road that doesn't close up when they are rain. So those basic things um, are, are very important to me. And that's why I think the foundation of building devolution, which is village councils, as in, 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 enshrined in the Constitution, as well as the County Government Act, is also a very cardinal institution that we must put in place so that these things that we want to do will be done. Thank you very much, prof Professor. Uh, you've, you've spoken a little bit about health. You know, this is really something which is uh, touching very many lives in Kenya. Yeah. And as we are speaking right now, nurses have actually been on strike for a couple of months. Yeah. Uh, do you have any plans at hand to ensure that these nurse, nurses actually come back to work? Well, what surprises me actually, and I've not had time really since I became governor to engage the council governors on this issue, although uh, because I've been doing some very basic things, it's just getting our country to, 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 to start up and get going. And the treasurer has not done us any, any, any good by not giving us gig, giving our counties any money. So we, have, we want to resolve nurses' issue, for example, but unless money comes from the treasury, it will be very difficult to resolve this nurses' issue. But more than that, when I was Minister for Medical Services, we used to resolve these strikes in, in no less than two or three weeks. They never went beyond that. I am really surprised this, this nurses' strike has gone on for more than close to six months now or more. I think, I think there must be something wrong between um, the council governors and the House in managing this aspect. But my first hunch is that since health is a devolved function, Afia House should surrender a lot of resources in the counties to make sure that health is properly run. Secondly, Afia House should not sit as a regulatory agency that is not conscious of or concerned about resolving this problem. I think that there must be a useful, productive, joint approach between the Council of Governors and Afia House. Something which somehow seems to be lacking in terms of discourse about this strike. There seems to be a, a disjuncture uh, between the Council of Governors and Afia House in dealing with this issue. But don't you think, Prof, that actually um, the Council of Governors really have done a die service to, uh, to, the, to, uh, to the Kenyan population? You know, the ex hospitals are pretty expensive and uh, they are people have really suffered for the last uh, four or five months. That's what I'm saying. I agree with you entirely. I mean, uh, since I took over in Kisum, I've, I've confronted this thing face to face. For example, when we had that crisis after the 8th, when the militia, these, these Majonis from Nairobi came beating our people up like nobody's business. I mean, we went there, we, some people were even afraid to go to hospital because they didn't know which hospital to go to. Uh, because the new government hospitals were, were, were not working. They didn't have the money to go to private hospital, so they were there just suffering until we brought them out in our emergency center and we said, look, we'll look after you. The most important thing to us is that you are well. We took them to Jaramogi Ogingo Dinga and uh, they also managed to get some nurses in the private sector who were, were prepared to do locum at, at Jaramogi to look after these people, which was a 
quite a good initi initiative on, top of, uh, on the part of the money manager of Gingadinga Hospital. Sure. Now, the point is that the, the issues seem to be ro ro you know, revolving around the terms of service of, of the nurses, because nurses are currently employees of the counties, mm -hmm. as in we say in the Constitution. But then there are regulations from the from Mafia House, as well as the Commissioner for uh, uh, Salary Review Commission, which a Salary Review Commission sets standards for for who to be paid what in the, in the public service. Then Mafia House are all these regulatory issues regarding promotion, regarding um, regarding uh, allowances to be paid and things like those which uh, exist in previous. I would have said uh, uh, employment agreement, uh, CBOs between them and the nurses. Now, those CBS, yeah, C CBO, CBOs or CBS, CBO, C collecting bargaining uh, agreement. Uh, CBS, yes. collecting bargaining agreement. Now, yes. you see that change from nurses being employed of the national government and nurses being employee employees of the county government. But the nurses would like the CBAs, which were signed before counties came into effect, to be ratified by the council governors so that they don't lose some the benefit they had under those CBAs. Now, these kind of legal technicalities um, should be overcome. Yeah, <clears throat> Kenyans are happy that um, there was one Kenyan who was really touched yesterday when you spoke about uh, when you were the Minister for Health you tried your level best to ensure that nurses and doctors don't go on strike. Mm -hmm. So are you still promising Kenyans that you are really going to lead this worthy cause to ensure that all nurses go back to work? Well, I promised myself, that's just promising myself, <laughs> okay. that uh, when we are finally inducted as governors, by the council of governors, and we, we, are, we resume operations as council of governors normally, as council of governors has been, I'm quite prepared to offer myself to be chairman of the health committee of the Council of Governors. Benefiting mainly from my experience in medical services, but also I think my, my knowledge of labor movements and uh, negotiations between employers and the employees, uh, what needs to be done when you are undertaking those negotiations. Because you see, in the final analysis, the, the culture of negotiation and, and, and the art of negotiation is very important. Uh, how do you, how do you uh, in a negotiating environment, take what you agree on, bracket what you can't disagree on, and underline controversial issues that cannot possibly be discussed under those circumstances? That is the first step that you must take in a negotiation. Uh, you, you, you must say, look, okay, look, this one we agree on. I, I don't think we want to contest this one. But this one, let us bracket because we, are, we don't completely disagree, but we have reservations we can discuss. And then some which are really controversial issues which are underlined uh, are where the, the, the talk will be very tough. So when you do that, then from one uh, negotiation to the other, you make progress. And this is important to, to lift the morale of those who are negotiating, and of course their constituencies outside that they must report to you. Remember, this union is also must keep their constituencies intact or supportive. So it is in their interest that sometimes they take very hard stand, so this wins them support from their constituencies. Now, the, your role as an employer is not to be angry or hostile when they take those stands, but to understand that if you are in their shoes, you will perhaps be doing the same. And if you would be doing the same, how would you then be persuaded to leave <laughs> your stand? Okay. So those are the things that really are the art of negotiations in, 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 in all these labor disputes that those who are involved in the negotiation should understand and, and, and see how they navigate through them. Thank you very much, Prof. Now, um, we might be having some investors who wants to come to Kisumu. Yeah. Are there incentives you are going to give the investors and encourage them to um, invest in Kisumu? The first incentive really is to make Kisumu governable and to create security and a good business environment in Kisumu. We have to deal with the land problems. I mean, if you don't have a good land registry and good post dispute settlement disputes in land, then 
very few people are going to come to invest, particularly where land is involved. And that has been the real problem in Kisumu, that um, this kind of lacuna in, in land registries and the inavailability of, of data on land that is reliable. By data on land, I mean if you go somewhere, see a, some, a plot empty, and somebody produces uh, Mweri as the owner. Is he really the owner? <laughs> okay. So this is what I call reliability of data mm -hmm. regarding land ownership uh, that makes land transaction possible. I think there are too many, too many, uh, what are gray areas in Kisumu, uh, and too many uh, non-transparency. Are you going to tackle those yeah, issues? Yeah, those, those you, are actually, you, you might. You might start making enemies pretty soon. Well, I, I know we are making enemies already yes. because of attacking those issues. Mm -hmm. But you see, if you make enemies for doing the right things, then, then you are okay. I mean, if, if you just govern without making enemies, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely something wrong. It means you're not making uh, some good decisions, um, you see, because in making decisions, you must, you must be prepared that somebody may not be very happy with the decisions that you make. But if they're in the public good, then you stand by them. Uh, and in the past, you see, public officials have made the land issue uh, complicated because rather than make good decisions, they receive bribes so that they can continue making bad decisions. Now, bribery and, 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 and bad governance must, must, be, must be eliminated. How are you planning, How are you planning to, I mean, to, 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 to make Kisumu a non-corruption? Uh, Zone. Well, I mean, it, it's a process, really. I mean, it's not something that can happen overnight. But one is by making laws very clear and, and making sure these laws and procedures and regulations are obeyed right from the top, you know, not just for the people at the bottom. Two, of course, making the public know what these laws and regulations are and, and, and making them know where things go wrong because in the final analysis, the public is your best defender. If, if, uh, they have, uh, if so every information. procedure, every procedure, uh, you will ensure that the public. They should know. They should know. Uh, and uh, what these days, you know, for example, when we came in, we found that our portal, our website, was not very good. We have been working on it so that information is available online and, and, um, and access to that information is easy. That is very important. And secondly, we are introducing new institutions in Kisumu to improve ease of doing business. One, we are taking to the county assembly first an, occasion, an occasional paper, a sessional paper, and secondly a bill establishing the, establishing the Kisumu Social and Economic Council. This council is important. It, it mirrors what we did at the national level, which is the National Economic and Social Council, which are part of the Jubilee government of, of, of left to die, I don't know why. But then we really want to establish that Kisumu, Kisumu County Economic and Social Council as a body in which the Kisumu County government will meet the private sector, both local and national and international, to help in uh, discussing all these issues of development and, um, and investment and so on. So that we could, through the Economic and Social Council, get a feedback on what we are doing, but also get some ideas of what the public expects especially business community and investors expect the county government to do to facilitate investments and, and, and business transactions and the delivery of social services. Thank you very much, Prof. Now let's uh, talk a little bit about um, the political situation back in Kenya. You've talked about the police. Uh, it's an allegation you are saying the police were uh, brutalizing people in Kisumu. Uh, we, we saw Baby Pendo die. And the, the police, even today, we saw them on the TV. They were claiming that, uh, I mean, they're still doing investigation. I mean, did you feed them all the information and shown them that surely the police did so many mistakes? I think that the police is hiding this word called they're doing investigation. You, know, you can't do investigation forever, especially when evidence has been put before you. I mean, if you're going to do the investigation about who killed baby Samantha Pendo, it's not difficult. The evidence was there. The only thing they needed to do is find out which officers were on duty in Yalenda at that hour, on that day, and get to question those officers. If they don't know the officers who were in Yalenda at that hour, on that day, it means the, the commander of the police in the county 
had people in the county working who were not under his command. This is what I told him. We met as a security team, and I told the commander, please make sure that the people who were in Kisumu on that material day were really under your command. In my own estimation, from what I could gather from the people, we had too many forces in Kisumu who were not under your command, who were causing these atrocious atrocities. That's why they remain a kind of mysterious force, because you didn't know them. Now, if they were not under your command, who was commanding them? So that guy should be able to tell us, okay, who was on duty uh, at that particular hour in Nyalenda, and at that particular hour, were there demonstrators in Nyalenda who were worth arresting? If they were not, what reason did they have to break into people's homes except malice? You see what I mean? Yeah, so, so, so this idea that they are still doing investigation, when we ourselves have offered as much information as we can, after interviewing the people, after seeing what happened, after burying Baby Pendo, there's no more evidence that they need in that regard. If you go to a place like Nyamasari and Kolwa, where the next day after the, after, on the 9th, they went during the day at about noon into the villages way in, inside the rural areas and started beating up people and uh, crashing their, their mobile phones and eating their food and, and destroying kiosks and taking food away. What were they doing in Kolwa at midday on the 9th of August? Was the destruction of people's kiosks and the smashing of their mobile phone part of the responsibility of duties they were supposed to undertake when they were there? They're what was this to do with, with, with demonstrators for that matter? They are still saying, I mean, they are doing the, I mean, the, the investigation. That's what I'm saying. That is a, a camouflage for not doing anything. Because if they were to do information, investigation, they should tell us what is the information about. And, um, or what is the investigation about? You know, Prof, maybe policemen cannot really investigate themselves. Are there any other channels to be followed so that that investigation can, can be done so that, I mean, the truth can, can be revealed? There is a boy called Independent Police Oversight Authority. Yes. That is the body we should do investigation for the police. We give this information to Independent Police Oversight Authority. When we put up an emergency and rapid response unit at Jomo Kenyatta in Santa National Sports Ground in Kisumu and appealed to people who are hiding their villages who might have been hurt to come there so that we could help them get access to treatment and to psychiatric attention for advice those who are traumatized. They came. And IPOA representative was there, so was the Red Cross and some other NGOs. So we shared the data we had with them. 171 people had been hurt, at least six people had died. We were still looking for other bodies, which we found one at Jaramogi Ogingo Dinga, who was unclaimed. We had all this evidence given and to them. Is this other allegation that? Um some residents found people, I mean, body bags in, uh, dumped in, the, in Lake Victoria. I mean, is that true? Well, you know, I would say the following, that at least one body was taken to Jaramogi or Gingo Dinga. Mm -hmm. The others, there were allegations from the people, but since we did not get the bodies ourselves, we can neither refute nor confirm the allegations, because our first of all, we ourselves did not have the ability to do investigations that far and maybe try and trace where the bodies might have gone. But my point is the following. When these militias, I call them, went to the villages and were carrying that bodies. Is a, that is a serious allegation. Yeah, because you oh. see, the reason why I'm calling them a militia yeah. is because the, the commander of the police in Kisumu, the only person I can rely on, Okay, does not seem to know who they were or under whose command they were. He has told you so. If he did, mm -hmm. then he would confirm that at 12 o'clock on the 9th, the people who were in the Kolua village came from this police, sta police station. Oh, these are their service numbers because we sent them there. He's not been able to, to, to say so. So I was trying to 
give him the benefit of the doubt. If you, don't, if you cannot honestly say so, then it means these people are not under your command. That's what I'm saying. Okay. If they were under his command, then he should be able to account for them. Thank you, Prof. Yeah. Let's now go to the NASA issues. Yeah. Or before we go to NASA issues, I mean, um, do you really believe that if NASA government takes over power, uh, the way you are really anticipating and really praying so hard to make it happen, are you really going to bring any change or uh, you also want to get power so that some of your lieutenants or some of your friends also get enriched? I mean, by, 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 by having that, I mean, by owning the power also? Well, you know, I mean, look, we have to be serious. I've now spent about 37 years in this table. And we've been involved not for material gain, you know that, because if it was, then we wouldn't be here today. For a long time, we, sh we should have been, even in Nyayo's cabinet, okay? Or even after being in the cabinet, we could be doing some other things where money is made. Because I don't think that at this point in time, I would be being a governor to make money. So what kind of money is that? I can make better money elsewhere, doing a much more important job, being, being justified as a minority report of what I do. Because as early as 1983, 84, I was working with the United Nations Organization as a P4 level. I was at the same level then with Kofi Annan at the UN in New York. But I left that to go back to teach so that I can be near home so that we can be in the struggle. Okay? So it's rather too late now, I mean, really, to, to begin thinking of making money by being in government, and rather stupid too. You see what I mean? So what we are saying is that, look, there are certain things that we think that devolution should achieve, which is not achieving. So since we were the architects of this constitution, and we know precisely what devolution should be achieving in our, uh, in our, in our county, that is some contribution I can make to the advancement of social progress and democracy in Kisumu County. And that's my interest. So if somebody is coming with me that has a different interest, who will betide him or her? <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Can you give um, from 1 to 10, uh, can you rate Jubilee government achievement since, the, I mean, since they took over power? One thing that people must know, that a lot of things that you believe boasts about that it is doing, especially in infrastructure, they inherited what they call from the coalition government. The standard gauge railway was something was first of all conceived in the NAC government through Vision 2030 and National Economic and Social Council. And I was there spanning minister when we would had we would now had a German engineer come to Kenya. And I took him to State House to demonstrate to President Kibaki our standard gauge railway from Mombasa to Nairobi, going all the way to Rongai, and from Rongai going all the way to Turkana into Sudan would look like. His idea was that rather than go through Israel and all that, we could have this railway going up through Rongai and going to Sukaka. At that point in time, the Japans already knew that Takana had a very high potential for oil, so we, had, we needed to connect Takana to Turkana to, to the coast. Okay, well, that never worked with this German entrepreneur. But the idea of being a standard gauge railway was there. So when President Kibaki and Prime Minister Ayo Molo Dingo were negotiating with the Chinese, an agreement was signed between the Kenyan government and the Chinese government to build a standard gauge railway at a cost much lower than what the Jubilee people have had now. Because I think what the Jubilee has done with a standard gauge railway from Mombasa to Nairobi is about $250 million more than what we did, if I remember well. So you cannot really give them any mark? I mean, how many, how many so, marks can you give them? So essentially, I must congratulate them for implementing that SGR, standard gauge railway, which we and both NARC and coalition government planned. What they did when they came in was to renegotiate the deal with the same... Why had they, why, why had they to, to do that? Why because they wanted it to, 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 to cost higher, according to them. I mean, I think, to me, I think they're so good at padding the thing with a little bit more money. 
so that people could eat. That's what I. You know, they are, prof. They are blaming you pretty much. I mean, the the now government. They are blaming you that you you are the people who really uh, made uh, huge mistakes, and they had to come and. Uh, make mistake, up mistake, the mess. mistake doing what? I mean, you 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 didn't uh, the, the 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 way the projects were were, were to be carried out. It's as if the NAC, um, they, they, they were calling them the NAC government, but then also wanted to eat something. I mean, they, no, no, that's they not were true. getting some king. No, 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 that's not really true. Because if you first of all, the NAC government, <laughs> the NAC government conceived the thing under the Vision 2030. You know, Vision 2030 had flagship projects uh, that, that, uh, that, that governments coming into power between now and 2030 had to implement because we were planning for the future. We were planning, say, not just when NAC is in power, but any other government that comes, this is in the interest of Kenya. Vision 2030 was for Kenyans, not for a particular government. And secondly, we set up two very important institutions to deliver Vision 2030. The Vision 2030 Secretariat, as well as the National Economic and Social Council. These two institutions, Jubilee has killed. So Jubilee is now carrying out Vision 2030 institution, without a Vision 2030 Secretariat, nor a National Economic and Social Council, we don't know Huru and Ruto doing these things in a very bad way. You see what I mean? I, we understand you. Yeah, so you, you can implement the same ideas, but in ways different from how they were, they, 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 they were conceived. The, the ideas will still be implemented, all right, but in the end, they cost the country more. Our children and children's children will have to pay this debt for a longer time. We didn't envisage it that way. Okay. So, and David D. has, in many of his writings, pointed this out to Kenyans, not me. If I did, people would say, you are doing it because you are, you are defending what you people did. No. And if you read even the East African, which at one point was comparing the cost of doing the SGR in Kenya as compared to doing it in Tanzania, it was almost five times more expensive the Kenyan than the Tanzanian one. If you compare the cost of doing it in Kenya with what they're doing in China itself. Then what made, I mean, what progress is Kenya making? Because we hear that the, now even the Rwandese, the, the, the Ugandans actually want to use the the Tanzanian route, which is even longer. What, what, what's so well, the well, look, the, the Ugandan way you use the Tanzanian route, but my, my take is this. There's no contradiction at all having two routes in East Africa. Sure. One from, from Dar es Salaam or, or, or whatever, or through central Tanzania going north, connecting Tanzania with Rwanda and Burundi and Uganda to, to the coast in Dar es Salaam in, 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 uh, in Tanzania and another railway from Mombasa going all the way through Malaba and connecting to Kampala and so on. There's nothing contradictory at all. These are complementary developments. After all, if you look at Europe, one of the reasons why Europe has advanced because it's, it's crossed by railways everywhere. So building the, 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 the Tanzanian Central Railway Line and doing the Kenyan uh, railway to, to, to Uganda to me, those are complementary because then both Uganda and Rwanda will have to trade through both Tanzania and to Kenya. That, to me, that's not an issue. But to me, that's a debate that I've always said is not necessary. Okay, and even do, after doing that, doing the lapset thing, it still will be there. Uh, we will have to rely more on railroad transportation in East Africa in the future than road transportation. Why do I say so? Because road transportation depends a lot on, 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 on petroleum products. Bitumen is a petroleum product. Gasoline is a petroleum product, okay? But railway, you will cut down on use of petroleum products in several ways. One, like we said in the NAC government, my preference for a railway line from Mombasa going to Uganda all the way to Congo, to the West African coast, was to use electricity power it with electricity. Now, the Kenya government said, we have a limited supply of electricity, so that that one win. That's a bullshit argument. Surely, that is what everyone is asking out here. I mean, why, why, No, why, because, why, you know, now? because, you see, the thing is that there's a huge potential of a hydroelectric electric production in, um, in Eastern Africa. Thabo Mbeki, when he was uh, president of South Africa, wanted to import electricity from the Congo using hydropower from 
the Congo River. Okay. We ourselves have for a long time imported electricity from Uganda using the Owen Falls Dam. All we need is do better than that, go a little bit further into the Congo and connect ourselves with the electric grid there. This means, of course, in having a kind of Eastern and Central Africa arrangement for the generation of electrical power. Now, we also have the geothermal power, which we are from Korea, which we are generating and uh, going to exploit. We have, poet we have potentiality for that geothermal power in the Eastern African region, okay? Now, when you come to, to buses, we can reduce our, uh, our dependence on, 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 on petroleum products by using solar power. In San Francisco, the buses in San Francisco are already being powered by solar. There's no God-given law looking into the future why trains cannot be powered by solar either. I mean, that science must be looked into. Sure. So, so I think that uh, by starting this line for Mombasa, uh, on diesel engine, and by the way, if you look at those diesel engines, they're, they're kind of per se, as it were. Uh, they're not the most modern diesel engines that you can think of. You know? So if, when all is said and done, what Jubilee government did from our original idea of doing this railway and uh, the kind of locomotives we, we envisaged when we were the NA government and, and, uh, and the coalition government, has been jubileeanized. And you know, you believe nice, you know what it means. It's part of the corruption. You die not get equality. You don't want discussion about it. You run roughshod against uh, criticism. Uh, and so you do what you want, notwithstanding that people are saying, wait a minute, we want to examine it. At the same time, while you are doing all that, the, 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 the debt, the public debt in Kenya now is 50% the GDP. That is a lot. Yeah. That is a lot. <coughs> so, <coughs> I'm not quite sure that <coughs> that is the price you want to pay for improving infrastructure. That is very serious. Now let's talk a little bit about now um, <coughs> NASA's preparedness to the election. And you are still um, not really, we are not, I mean Kenyans are not pretty sure whether we are going to have election on 26th of October. Are you going to see some um, some of your demands to ensure that at least we have some elections in uh, in, in October 26? No, there was a famous saying which, which which goes like we must chew and walk. We must chew gum and walk at the same time. We have said very clearly that we cannot go to election with IBC as it is and with those observations that were made by the Supreme Court, not heeded to. Well, we had already we had already can actually ceded some of our demands by calling these ones irreducible minimum. That is not... <laughs> you see, <laughs> irreducible minimum saying, look, mm -hmm. we have tried our best to make concessions. Yes. But in the final analysis, if we go further than this, then there's nothing we are doing for ourselves. Yeah. Further than this, then we could as well not be talking. So that's why we call them irreducible minimums. But what is interesting is that actually the IBC, Chebukati, appreciate when you look when you when you saw the letter he wrote to to Chiloba and then even when he recently he sent some of his people packing and even when he said there are certain reforms he must undertake to make the elections possible all of them all those moves were kind of trying to say look we think this is a new movement are also good for us, you see. The problem is Jubilee, which is, will oppose anything that comes from NASA. The trouble with Jubilee is that they wait until we say something, then they formulate a reaction. They have, but they have already um, instituted some, uh, um, I don't know whether they call them reducible minimums from their side. And they no, from their the side what they did is they said, look, they know that if the law is as it is today, rigging elections becoming becomes very difficult. So they are moving to change the law to relax the possibility for rigging the elections. In, fact, in other words, they are reducing the chairs of the powers of the chairman, they are reducing the powers of the Supreme Court, and making 
the, 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 the decision of the Supreme Court less rigorous. They are stopping the Supreme Court from doing certain things. They are also saying that any commissioner can, uh, can chair the, the commission, which means that if they think that a certain commissioner is not as strong as it should be, they're not touching the executive, uh, the, the CEO, Chulubas. No, no, no. Chulubas' position, they're not touching. Although Chuluba is the person who um, all fingers are pointing to for the mistake that were done in CEO, but Jubilee is protecting him. The man they are up against is, is the chairman, who they th feel is trying to implement the Supreme Court decisions. And then they're saying that any judge can swear in Uhuru. You see? Meaning that the, the law that is the Supreme Court uh, president, or the chief justice who should share him, and now the, real, the thing that uh, um, Justice Maraga is a stickler for, 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 for constitutionalism and the rule of law. That this reminds me of what happened during Kenyatta and more years. You change the law to solve a political problems. In 1982, Moi changed the constitution, introducing Section 2A, making Kenya a one-party state by law, because he realized that moves to more former Socialist Party in 1981 is perhaps what led to the discontent in 82 uh, that led to the attempted coup. So you change the law to protect your regime. In 1996, when members of parliament uh, from Kanu broke away and formed an opposition party called KPU, people like Moya changed the law, making it mandatory that when you, when you, when you def de 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 defect from the party on which you elected, you have to go and seek mandate from the people. And then they made it very difficult for those people to seek mandate from the people, especially those who are coming from areas other than Nyanza. You see? So they knew exactly what they are doing by using the law to achieve political ends. This is exactly what Jubilee is doing. That's why when we say that Jubilee is trying to return us the old days of repression and authoritarian rule, we mean exactly that. That what they are doing is very reminiscent of what Kenyatta did and what Moe did, using the law to solve what they think are their political problems. Now, if every time you have a political problem, you change the constitution and change the law, what's the point of having the rule of law? They are saying, I mean, I mean they, are, they are basically making that one so that the process can be completely very smooth without any problem. Yes, no? smooth. <laughs> very smooth so that we can <laughs> rig. That's what they interpret of smoothness. We don't think it's smooth. We think it's very rough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, another thing we also want to know is about the, uh, the war against the Supreme Court. Uh, from especially from the Jubilee side, they also accused the court for giving some. Um, 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 spe I mean, uh, disparaging the uh, Supreme Court judges and uh, some high court judges. But right now, it's from the Jubilee side. I mean, they are. They, they are. They are well, they are, I, but, but you know, uh, to tell the truth, I don't think court or even us has ever disparaged the Supreme Court or judges the way the way the way Jubilee does. At one point, Jubilee lawmakers even abused Odunga. Yeah, it was on record. Yeah, it was on record. Yeah. And they have told lies about the relationship between some of our lawmakers and members of the, of, of, of the bench. Like when they were saying uh, Orengo was related to these people, and I don't know to who. Complete balderdash, lies, open lies. And then what is worse is that the latest I had from my jubilee, Honcho, which really surprised me, is that they were, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were alleging that the judges who formed the majority decision were actually bribed by Jimmy Wanjigi. I thought that was really preposterous. I mean, do they have the evidence? Because they, have they don't need to have evidence. You know, they don't need to allege. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, they don't need to have evidence. They don't need to allege. I, I, didn't, I didn't comment when this fellow was telling me. I just thought this is really now base. I mean, this is really based because I don't see anybody in a Supreme Court, especially the person of people like Justice Maraga, Justice Mwilu, and Justice Lenaula. And I don't see those people making that kind of decision because they are bribed 
by the opposition. Maybe Jubilee it themselves wanted to bribe them and they failed, so they assumed that the other side must have bribed them. I mean, I don't know. But I thought that it was an extremely responsible position, statement to make, but they make too many irresponsible statements. You, 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 you don't, you can't get surprised. Yeah, you know, when, when court gives some statements, Jubilee gives some, I mean, or some statements, you know, the Chief Justice really came out and uh, read a very, 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 very serious statement. You know, yeah. it's not something we can really uh, hope to really hear from a, a Supreme Court judge. You know? Yeah, I think, I think, I think, too much. No, but I think Justin Marada just wanted to defend the independence of the Supreme Court and of the judiciary. And he wanted to go on record in no uncertain terms where he stands. You know, there's a song we used to sing, and we still sing in Christian hymn books, once to every man and nation comes a moment to decide. Then it is the brave man chooses while the coward stands aside. Justice Maraga is a brave man. A moment came and he decided and made his decision known. You may hate him for it, you may like it for it, him for it, but it was a Justice David Maraga decision. I'm not saying that in uh, 2013, Justice William Tunga did not make a decision. He did make a decision. But the manner in which Justice Maraga court finally went out of their way to make sure that each justice told the public the reason why they made the decision was quite exceptional compared to what Justice William Mutunga Supreme Court did in 2013. I think that tells you the, the extent to which Justice Maraga values the independence of the courts and need for transparency. In the case of Willy Mutunga, we were told you are, you are going to read the thing in their website. I don't think this is a very good statement to my mother. <laughs> With the word website, she doesn't know, but she will sit down, watch television, and listen, and see these people, Anna Kwahana, what they're doing. I think that the difference with Justice Baraga and my friend William Mutunga. Thank you very, very much, Prof. Uh, our last question is about your preparedness again. Um, have you really prepared your your um, <coughs> your agents who are going to the polling stations to ensure that they uh, they make the uh, I mean the, they make I mean, they they make sure that. When the polls, I mean, when the polls get closed at, uh, let me say, at 5 p.m., when everybody has voted or whatever extension they'll get, they'll ensure that they'll, they, they'll sign all those forms and actually send you the, the, the information uh, pretty soon, the way you, 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 you might actually need them to be, uh, to be relayed to your, to, your, to your telling centers. I'm very concerned about the preparation of agents. In fact, just before I left Nairobi, we had a meeting with Prime Minister some of us governors, and we raise this issue. Look, this time we must really, really prepare our agents. I know we are laying emphasis on agents who volunteer, who will be agents because of their conviction, but even them must be trained. People must know what happens in a polling station. What is from 34A? How is it filled? What is its importance? Who signs? After it has signed, who is it taken to? It is taken to the constituency returning officer, who then fills from 34B from that form. And in those steps, unless the agents sign, those forms are not valid. Secondly, what is it that is in form 34A that every agent must know, check, not just the votes the candidates get, yes, that is important. But figures must be there of registered voters, of the number of voters who cast their vote, of the spoiled battle papers, okay? And of ballot papers were not spoiled, but where objections were raised by either party. 
So it's not just a question of signing Form 34A, of knowing the content of the form you are signing. So that that form, once it goes to the returning officer at the county filing center, can be used for filling Form 34B. Again, for Form 34B now has specific content that the agents must know before they sign it for transmission to the telling center in Nairobi. Now, these things were canvassed before the Supreme Court. And it is the NASA case that brought out very clearly the shortcomings in the election by the fact that the law was not followed and proper documentation was not done. Documents were falsified. Numbers were increased in favor of Uhuru and reduced for Ayla. Imagine in our stronghold, Siaya, Kisumu, Migori, and Homa Bay, that is where the biggest travesty was done to Raila Molodinga. You find Ramila not having votes in Kisian, in my own county. Not a single vote, and Uru getting the votes. Maybe the other vote being spread to the other candidates. So the idea of Maybe those were what they were saying. Yes. No, they were not clerical writers, because in the final analysis, they found themselves in Form 34B, which the returning officer in Nairobi used to compile the final data, presidential data, to this candidate, you see. So the tactic was that in Nyanza, try and reduce Raila's votes as much as possible, because people will not realize it. When you finally go to the, uh, to the county telling center and the figures are announced, or in Kisumu County, Raila has, uh, 230,000 votes, when it, what he could have had was about 330,000, but you have reduced it substantially. When you go to Meru, where Raila is, 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 is getting some votes, you reduce the votes maybe by two, by three, by four here and there, and that in the final analysis amounts to much. You see what I mean? So there was tactics of reducing the vote, the votes, reducing drastically in our strongholds reduces marginally in places where we had made inroads, so that in the final analysis, Raila doesn't make a very strong showing in Meru, but in Nyanza it makes a strong showing, but might be, might be might minus about 50,000 votes. And you go to Nyamira, you find a situation where Raila's votes are substantially hived off to Uhuru, and in the, in the end, Uhuru wins in Nyamira. When you know, in actual fact, Uhuru did not win, this was manipulation of figures 34A, 34B. Now, if our agents don't know, they just say, okay, maybe here Uhuru has won by about five votes. That's not too bad. Let me just sign. So are you planning, I mean, most people are now saying that you are planning to lock Uhuru from Nyamira and Kisi counties. And you know, recently, recently, um, I, let me say it's a week ago, it, I, uh, one of his uh, lieutenants actually died in Kisi, Mr. Yancha, and Mr. Uru never showed up at the funeral, and people were really complaining, you know, this is the only jubilee guy they knew from the area, so... Well, but, but see, that's not our headache, like that, that, that like that. <laughs> that's like the Nigerians say, yeah. I, go, I go take the panel of the, day, the headache behind us. <laughs> no, that's their headache. We, we, are not, we are not one to be engaged in a, in a debate as to where Uru is paying attention to his left hand or not. Yes. But truth be known, that Uru did not beat Raila and Yamira. And what we are doing in the coming election is to make sure that in our strongholds, we stop that malpractice happening by making sure that the turning officers, the presiding officers, do the correct job. That's why we are saying in the appointment of presiding officer and returning officers, the two parties must be consulted by Jubilee so that we don't get national intelligence service people running the IABC. Now, if you notice, the late, the one of the issues of, uh, I was reading to you, uh, Business Daily, where the security forces are getting eight to 10 billion shillings to run this election on the 26th, with the uh, NIS itself getting 2.8 billion. The question is, what would the police and NIS be doing with so much money?
and yeah. they have already reduced the, the, the allocation to the yeah. judges. I mean, yeah. what's the criteria they are using? I don't know. The the see, you should be telling them. So, so Kenyans what's really happening. But what's happening is because they want NSS and, 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 what? and, and the police to help. How them. can you reduce the... Um, um, how can you really reduce the money for the and I mean for 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 Supreme Court or whatever or the judicial system? It's just no, no, no. It's it basically just just vindictive. They're just being vindictive because they're being vindictive. Uh, they they're putting premium on political survival rather than advancing democracy and good governance in the country. Thank you. Let's now have this last question now from a personal level, Professor. Yeah. And again, thank you very much for giving us a star. Uh, you, you, you brought us a stand. We are really uh, are proud of Lopita Nyongo. There is your brother, many Kenyans especially who are young, don't really understand what really happened back in the 1980s. Uh, did you lose a brother? Um, and up to now, you have not actually found where he is or where he's buried as we speak right today? It was in July 1980, actually. 1980. July 1980. We are having problems at the University of Nairobi. Uh, yes. big, um, the, the, I was being. I was, we had had a demonstration against British sale of arms to South Africa to the apartheid regime. That demonstration was also in solidarity with progressive forces in Guyana, where Professor Walter Rodney had been assassinated. So. We were holding a demonstration to condemn uh, the government of Forbes Burnham in Guyana, which had assassinated Professor Walter Rodney, who was a very progressive historian and pan-Africanist, who had wrote this book, How Europe and the Developed Africa, a very revolutionary and eye-opening book. Uh, that, 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 that became an, op uh, an eye-opener to young people wanting to know the history of Africa and the role of imperialism and the origin of Africa's underdevelopment. So Rodney t was teaching in Dar es Salaam, then he went back to his mother country, Guyana, really to say, look, I want to also cause change in my own country, when he was suddenly firebombed, not, not firebombed, later bombed in Guyana. So, we decided to organize a demonstration at the University Staff Union. That demonstration was organized by uh, the late George Mukangi, the late Mukarunganga, myself, and um, uh, I would say some other progressives that were working with, uh, Dr. Wangombe and others at the University of Nairobi and Kenyatta University. Now, what happened was that in those days, the special branch then used to infiltrate demonstrations and they would bring in hooligans who would throw stones and then the university would be blamed. In that particular demonstration, we really organized it well and we had marshals and we made sure that we, we marched through town and went up to, uh, up to what is now Comesa Ground and we held a very successful rally there condemning the, 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 the then Moi regime. Um, for uh, continuing the footsteps of Kenyatta and continuing the repression and all that. So the next day, this demonstration was on Thursday. The next day, Friday, the, the Daily Nation wrote a very good editorial on that demonstration, saying for the first time the university has had a very successful demonstration. They had a rally which was successful. They talked very civilly about imperialism and people should listen for, for what the university are saying. There's no need combine, condemning all the time that these are Marxists and so on. Okay? That was the line that people like Mweno always took, condemning and to being Marxists. There's nothing wrong about being Marxist, but Mweno thought otherwise. Anyway, so on Saturday when I was working in my office in Nairobi, a guy called Peter, what is that name, Peter somebody, Peter Gachati or Peter, I can't remember. He was working with the, the then Kenya Times, which was a Sunday newspaper, big broad like this. So Peter called me in my office and asked me, we are here that you people are plot, plotting to overthrow the government. I said, no. But uh, apparently we, the, 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 the demonstration the other day was, was organized just to begin the, uh, the the movement to, to overthrow the government. No, there's nothing like that. I'm not, if, if there's something like that, personally, I'm not aware of it. 
So anyway, the next day on Sunday, there was a big headline in, in Sunday Times. Uh, okay. It was called Nairobi Times. Uh, you vastly lecturer denies plot charge. Because you know that headline is very, very catchy. Vasi lecturer denies plot charge. Which, which means that Vasi lecturer knows there's a charge, there's a plot, but he's denying it. So of course, the next day early in the morning, about five, these special branch people came and picked me up, went and locked me up and followed questioning. And then the students decided to go on strike if I was not released. So they went on strike, there was nothing going on in the university. I was in this police, police, the, police uh, the interrogation for three days, they couldn't go back. So the police realized that they had to release me, otherwise nothing would go on the university. So finally they released me, I went back to university, started teaching. And uh, in the meantime, they went and picked up this guy, Peter. I don't know his other name. His other name, no, excuse me. They went to pick it up to go and t tell his side of the story. So he went and told his side of the story. After he was gone, come Thursday, these people came and picked me up again. The moment they picked me, the student went on strike. So I think they decided that to, to divert my attention from being around, they had to disappear with my brother in Mombasa, who looked exactly like me. He was 10 years younger than me. So then I had to go to Mombasa and start looking for my brother, which, took, which is, took three weeks. We never got him. Uh, so came back to Nairobi. What was he doing in Mombasa? He was working with ESO. He was the, he was the, what do we call it? He was the, he was the supplies manager for ESO. Supplies manager, I mean, yeah. was he also doing some demonstration? Was no, he no, 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 he was just a professional. He never participated in anything. No, when he was no, when he was in the university, he was a, he was he used to be active in student politics, but once he joined ESO, he was he was a ESO employee. Continue, professor. So anyway, so we we looked for his body. We could never find him. But what made me stop is that one day, you know, it was a very grueling exercise because I used to go to mortuaries, look at dead bodies. We we the, the man at the port. A certain Mr. Chanda, who was commanding the, the port police, was very useful. He even uh, managed to organize some British divers, very experienced army people, to dive because my brother was. Uh, they, they alleged that my brother was pushed from the, off the ferry. You know that ferry. Yeah, the Coney, the Coney yes. ferry. So they looked at that channel up and down. In the end, they told me, no, no, no. we don't think he was pushed off the ferry. Because if he was. We know the geography of this area. By this day, we should have, the body should have surfaced in this place. So, because bodies, did, they, did, they knew how bodies surfaced after they'd been down there for some time. And they said no. Uh, and in that corridor, there were no sharks. So it said, if he was really pushed from the ferry, then we could have recovered the body. But his car was found on the ferry allegedly, and taken to the police station. The car was a police station when I was there. So one evening, when I was after um, a long day of search, I was sitting at Castle Hotel, you know, Castle Hotel on Mamagina Street at about five, and I was having my beer at the counter. And then at one point, I left the counter to go to the washroom. I came back, continued taking my beer, and all of a sudden, I started feeling zungu zungu, you know what I mean? So I said, no, some, somebody must have poisoned me. So I rushed to the car, drove the car to the, to the home where I was staying. I puked like nobody's business. And then I started sweating. So I was staying with Jared Angira Otieno and his wife, Jane, was a nurse. So Jane came and gave me some drugs, uh, which sent me to sleep. And while I was asleep, I think they called a doctor, which came and gave me some injections. I didn't know. So finally, that was about six. Finally, I woke up at midnight. Then they told me what happened, and we talked. And then Jerry said, no, my friend, this is too dangerous. If you stay out this week, may I also kill you, so go back to Nairobi. So I left, went back to Nairobi. That's how I gave up research. Several years later, in 19... 89.
I think, 88, 89. My parents wanted to put a closure to this thing. You know, after so long, you want to do something cultural sure, to forget sure. it. So they told me I should make a one last effort to find out what happened. So I went and engaged um, Mr. Khan, who used to be a police officer. During those days, in fact, one of those people interviewed me. I was teaching his son at USIU. Um, uh, um, I was teaching Asif Khan, his son. So Asif told me that his father was uh, having a private eye uh, investigation agency. They had, they had office on top of Woolworths. I went and saw Khan. He told me, that, OK, I know the story. Let me see if we can, we can do it. After about two or three weeks, he called me and said, my friend, you just forget this thing. Because essentially, this thing would mean that you get a 20 general to institute an inquiry. And, uh, the people who are involved with the here that the Attorney General is introducing an inquiry. Should he agree, you'd be in trouble. So you better leave this thing. So I left. So my wife's uncle was teaching with Patrick Shaw at uh, Starehe. You know Patrick Shaw, the yes, yes. good. So my he told me, look, why don't we go talk, talk to Patrick Shaw? Patrick Shaw to help. So he introduced me to Patrick Shaw. I went to see Patrick Shaw. One day, Patrick Shaw took me to the football field in Starehe. Then he packed his Volvo on the touchline. And he told her, let's go. I went to the middle of the field. So he told me, let's talk here. So I said, why do we have to talk here? I said, this is the safest place because anywhere uh, it may be hard. With my car there, it's monitoring any movement of any kind of vehicle that may be is dropping, so let's talk. So I explained him what happened, we talked, then he told me, look, I'm only going to repeat what Khan told you. I know the case. If I were you, better you are alive, because your brother is going anyway. So I went and told my parents, so we gave it up. So that is the story. Solved murders, yeah, yeah, one after the other one. Yeah, yeah. So you know when people are talking about mm, the struggle in rather flippant terms, you know, you people don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's let's laugh, but let's get, let's. Um, you know the thing is, you know there are so many young Kenyans who don't really know these stories. Yeah, yeah. You know when they hear about struggle, they just they basically just think it's a joke. Yeah, yeah. Right now, as we are speaking, Prof. University of Nairobi students are being killed. Yeah. They are being maimed. Yeah. They are being brutalized. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, nobody is really taking um, yeah. um, account. Nobody is really taking charge. Yeah. We had the um, one of the interviews. I think it must have been in NTV. Linus Kaikai was interviewing the the police. I mean, uh, the IG, yeah. Mr. Boynet. Yeah. I mean, he's saying they are still doing investigation, and the students uh, were caught. I mean, they, they were the ones who are hurting yeah. other. Motorists, let me say bystanders around yeah. the streets in Nairobi. Yeah. That's where the police actually had to go to. to, to the students must also learn, and uh, this is what I was taking, telling people in Kisumu. Yes. When you are demonstrating, the kiosk is not your enemy. There's nothing the kiosk has done. The kiosk has not sold an election. The kiosk owner was not there with the, with the Jubilee to alter from 34A. This is uh, somebody struggling for his life here in Kisumu. There's no need burning tires on the road. This road is going to be used by your uncle who drives a tuk-tuk to pay your cousin's school fees. If you make a portal here, your uncle will come with a tuk-tuk, hit this portal, and the car will be coming from behind, hit him. We have disaster. So don't burn tires on the road in your own city, Kisumu. It hurts you, it hurts the economy of this city. You can demonstrate peacefully and make your word known, carrying twigs, you know, going to demonstrate in, police, in front of the police station, you know. But what the architect, like especially the students who are, who are in classes, right? They are no, but the point now, listen. Yes. The one with the, the police then go and beat in the dormitories and yes. the classes are innocent. Sure, that's what just like, just like uh, all these militia mm -hmm. 
who then went into Nyalenda at night and killed ba baby Pendo, Samantha Pendo. At six months, you don't expect Samantha Pendo to have been demonstrating. Even Mara. <laughs> Even <Mara>. <laughs> So, <coughs> both the police <coughs> and the students who hit cars on the road are irresponsible. The, we demonstrated in the university very effectively, the one I've just told you, yeah. which angered the state. Mm -hmm. The states get very angry when you hold a successful, peaceful demonstration and you make your point with placards and everything else. They want you to make a mistake so that they can beat you up. That, that's too brutal. I mean, do the, the policemen also have kids in universities? Yeah, but I'm not defending them. I'm I know, I know, I know, I hear you. I'm, I'm only saying yes. that they are cruel. Yeah. They are brutal, they are irresponsible, they are fascist. So I had to defend my people in Kisumu by saying, let us demonstrate, not destroying our property, but also know that when you are demonstrating, be ready for the consequences. And I also told the policemen, if you beat us when you are demonstrating peacefully, don't think we are going to turn, take it lying down. <laughs> yeah. So now, they, now there is a truce in Kisumu. Mm -hmm. When we are demonstrating, the police keep their distance. We do our demonstration, we finish. You know, because they know if they come demonstrating without one, we are peaceful. Thank you, Prof. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. It has been a wonderful time. Yeah. Thanks once again for giving us this opportunity to talk to you. And when you come back again to America, please, you are welcome to our studios. You can give us more suggestions on how we can really uh, ensure that Kenya really moves forward. Thanks. And uh, we've, we've got some NASA supporters in America, in Canada, and uh, uh, in Britain who really uh, love to hear what uh, Jacob says or Baba says. Yeah. What can you tell them? That's your closing remark. My closing remarks is please, please, please do your best to make sure we win this election. Send money to pay our agents and to hold rallies. It is very expensive. When our principals hire one helicopter for one day, the cost is 800,000 shillings to 1 million shillings. For one day, one helicopter. It's not cheap. People like Uhuru can get that money from financing this election. The 2.8 billion shillings given to NIS, believe you me, Two billion is going to them to finance their own campaign. That's an allegation, Prof. It's an allegation? Yes. Yeah. You can't verify or we can't prove that. Uh, well, uh, it's, a very, it's a very reasonable allegation. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Prof. Okay. For your time. Thank you. We thank appreciate you. for that. Thank you. Yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, viewers. Uh, we are done right now. Again, once more, thank you and uh, be listening to our views from people like Professor and any other person who really want Kenya to move forward. Thank you once more and let's meet again. Thank you very much. Thank you.